Chris 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 Hello everyone, my name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects, which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for watching the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Are you interested in sponsoring Dev Sector Series? Please call me at 234-703-539-8086. As we spread your brand, we spread around the world. And as we do that, we are all changing the world. So let's work together. Contact me so that we can maximize social impact. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello everyone, welcome to the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Please make sure you like and share this broadcast so that we reach more people. And also let me know where you're watching from so that I can thank you personally. Follow and connect with me on all my social media handles for future updates, okay? Now our website is finally up. Please visit our website at www dot social impact dot ng okay so make sure you visit our website whenever you get a minute okay so remember that um ngo fundraising for social impact social impacts masterclass very first online course is going to be up for beta launch monday september the 13th 2021 if you want to be part of the waiting list you can give me a call or look at the link on the on the tinker down there and then you'll be able to get the information if you're interested as well in the comments just put interested and then i'll revert with all the details okay so if you have any questions about this broadcast please engage please engage and i will further engage with you on throughout the duration of this broadcast so i'll be interacting with you all in, in, in case you missed this broadcast, we broadcasted this uh, episode about five months ago with Mr. Bumi Akinyemiju, who is the CEO of Venture Garden Group, which is the venture arm of Greenhouse Capital that has invested in over 20 fintech startups across sub-Saharan Africa. They were one of the early investors of Flutterwave, in case you didn't know. So within the group of the uh, Venture Garden Group, um, there's Garden Social Ventures, which is a social enterprise that focuses on so providing support for impact organizations in aggregating data to better communicate their impact through technology, okay? So what I want you all to do is check out this, uh, this live streaming of our interview. And let's discuss in the comment section, okay? I look forward to having a better uh a conversation with you, okay? Take care and see you shortly. Serial entrepreneur, technology innovator, and investor. He is the CEO of Venture Garden Group, VGG, a high growth technology investment holding company, which has incubated and invested in a group of FinTech companies 
that provide innovative technology platforms that address payment and data inefficiencies across multiple sectors of the African economy. One of the subsidiary companies under the VGG portfolio is Garden Social Ventures, an indigenous social enterprise that leverages technology to drive impact assurance in the social sector. One of her recent solutions is the trial product, a monitoring and evaluation solution that analyzes and aggregates data to effectively inform the work of organizations that are changing the world. As part of the leadership at the Venture Garden Group, Bumi and his team have dedicated their work and resources to transforming Africa through technology and have successfully led several impactful change projects through strategic, public and private sector partnerships. He is also a founding partner at Greenhouse Capital, GHC, the venture arm of the Venture Garden Group, which has invested 20 innovative fintech companies across Africa. Some of the most ambitious startups in West Africa make up the GHC portfolio. Typically, GHC is the first check for highly ambitious tech entrepreneurs. Bumi has a passion for nation building and is currently volunteering at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group to help contribute to the transformation of Africa using digital. In 2017, Bumi was nominated as one of the top 100 most influential people of African descent in business and entrepreneurship by the United Nations. VGG was also recognized by the British Parliament for its contributions to transparency and good governance in Africa. In 2018, Bumi received the Trailblazer Award at the Nigerian American Multicultural Council and VGG was recognized for its support to the federal government of Nigeria in digitizing social intervention delivery. Let me present to some and introduce to others, Mr. Bumi Akiyemiju. Bumi Akiyemiju uh, is a... Okay. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bumi, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Efua. I appreciate it. Great, great, great. So um, I'm very excited about this conversation about, um, about uh, technology and data and social impact because I feel like, what, you know, technology, as, as uh, the techies say, it's more of an enabler to the work that we do uh, uh, in various sectors. So uh, thank you again. You've done amazing, amazing work in, uh, in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and that's what is much needed uh, right now. So um, I, I guess I'm going to get to it because I think everybody has been looking forward to this conversation. So um, like we said, you know, you've been addressing various sectors of the economy. You've, uh, you've worked with various startups addressing various sectors. I think I was listening to one of your interviews at the uh, Marketplace Africa. You were like, you started off with um, education, addressing aviation. So now I um, wanted to just get a sense from you why the social sector? Yeah, thank you, F1. And, and by the way, you know, you're doing an awesome job. Your energy is so contagious. <laughs> and you. I feel like just standing up and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> out of excitement, so you know. You no, so but, but yeah, but thanks for having me. And um, I, I, I really, um, you know, have been looking forward to this. Um, you know, because right from making the decision to move back to Africa, right? And many of us, you know, it's the same story. You're out there in the US, in the UK, in Australia, wherever, but there's really nowhere like home, right? That's and right. ultimately, no matter where you go, you know, you travel to Chicago, to New York, to California, to Dubai, you walk in, and the the you know everybody is looking at the beauty or how things are organized and you are just asking yourself in your head why is my home country not like this 
why is it that people are lined up here and we're not lined up at home why is it so i think that was really the inspiration of you know making the decision you know i was running three businesses you know three startups in michigan that i was part of starting had 100 employees things were going pretty well but saying guys you know i'm out i'm going back to africa we want to create a technology company and you know this technology company we wanted to focus on developmental sectors so that it's not just let's make money because obviously that's important but it's also how do we make impact how do we create jobs and how do we enable african africans to be able to accomplish you know essentially that potential and that's what brought me to you know back to you know to nigeria so 10 years into it now i've grown some gray hair but <laughs> at, the, <laughs> but at the end of the day i'm actually happy i'm happy that you know i i, I made that decision i'm happy about my co-founders and partners that joined me in this journey happy with the team that I've been able to build over the years and we were very deliberate we we're like hey first let's go into education how can technology help to transform education right both in terms of more access quality right and the ability to just be able to deliver you know the right type of you know education to all africans at an affordable cost and what role can technology play you know then we moved to you know aviation logistics right i mean if you think about you know the men that built america how america was built it really came down to you know building the roads infrastructure the bridges the the motor vehicle you know power and energy so just thinking about that path for africa we're like okay let's go into logistics let's look at you know air connectivity and how to improve it then we went into utilities and power because if we don't have power we can't produce anything and then let's go into banking because ultimately if we don't create the payment rails that connects diaspora and international markets to home then money would not be able to move if money doesn't move trade will not happen if trade doesn't happen we're not creating jobs and we cannot develop and then social sector why social sector i mean um after all of this work in aviation in education in in, in power in, in digital banking and payments there was just one recurring theme which is when you look at the addressable market of any product that you bring to Africa, after doing it for a while, you kind of realize that, oh, there's this country with 200 million people, there's this continent with 1.2 billion people, but at the end of the day, what is that GDP per capita? What is the earning power for the individuals? And can they actually buy this iPad uh, or I, you know, iPod Air um, thing? you know can they buy a 200 dollar device because you just want to have some earpiece and then you realize that your addressable market is not 200 million maybe it's actually 100,000. then all of a sudden it's a big realization and you find that there's this missing people who are not participating in economic activities because they have to be lifted up and and how do you reach them when you can't connect with them when you don't know who they are when you don't understand what the gaps are and meanwhile there's also a whole bunch of capital you know there's a lot of charity money that is global right the the wealth around the world that's looking for impact i want to make a difference i want to you know but they don't know how right i mean they don't know how that's literally why bill gates the world's richest man had to create his own foundation and say he is going to be him and his wife are going to run it themselves because they just weren't sure that there are enough intermediaries and the ecosystem was rich enough so they had to actually create an organization themselves so i think that was the gap we saw that we're like okay technology can help to create this bridge between you know countries that want to achieve interventions wealthy people that want to achieve intervention and the common man or woman or child 
that is not connected, does not have a phone, is not counted in any sensors, does not, you don't know their address, you don't know how many meals a day they have, and you don't know what intervention they need for the environment that they are. I think that is the gap. And then for me, it was just like, technology can be an answer, and that's why we're here. Okay. Thank you so much for that in terms of you really talked about it in the, on, the, on a macro level. So it gives us an idea of why, why, why uh, uh, you know, technology is needed to address, to find out the needs of, uh, of uh, people in society. So, um, so I'm going to go into the next question. So like you've talked about the need for technology now, like, okay, we need technology to address the needs of the society, to now lift off, lift people up out of poverty, especially through charity from private and various um, agencies. So how, so now we've talked about the why now. So like, how um, can that happen? How might smart technologies be leveraged for social impact evaluation? Um, that is, it's been, I've, been in the social sector for many, many years. And coming back to Nigeria, it's still the same challenge. It's like, okay, impact, how do we measure it? And various large organizations still struggle <laughs> with um, longitudinal studies and even um, um, you know, outcome monitoring, indicator management. So how, how might these smart technologies be leveraged for social impact evaluation in Africa? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Efwa, for that question. And I think the way I'll answer that is to just say, hey, look at every other industry. Look at banking. Look at logistics. Look at e-commerce. Look at, you know, even um, biosciences in terms of DNA testing and genome. Look at, like, the speed at which the world created the, the COVID vaccination. All of that stuff did not happen by virtue of manual efforts and traditional thinking, right? You know, the ability for all of us to be like in one room for almost one year, not going anywhere, and you get things delivered to you, you have access to pay electronically, you're able to, you know, you know, Amazon blew up as a company, like exactly. logistics companies became more prevalent. So I think if you think about the role that technology played mm -hmm. in that evolution, based on mobile technologies, based on data analytics, machine learning, you know, based on, you know, fintech technologies and, and, and cloud, you know, technologies. So all the building blocks, you know, internet of things so all of those building blocks is now there today right and those are the technologies that have helped in all of those sectors i mentioned so why not the social sector why not why not social impact evaluation right so i almost feel like it's just that you know people probably think about this sector last traditionally meanwhile the addressable market and the pain point is massive you know, and what I keep telling people is that what we're seeing with fintech every day, fintech, 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 I, I see that happening in the social tech space. You know, it's just that people have to kind of like key in that there is the opportunity to use those same IoT and mobile and machine learning for M&E, for, you know, identity, for reporting and analytics, you know, for all of these different things. Like think about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is now big. Think yeah. about, you know, uh, crypto. Everybody talks about Bitcoin and crypto and crypto exchanges. They're now mm -hmm. billion dollar crypto exchanges. But what's a crypto exchange doing? It's connecting people who want to, you know, buy crypto or trade crypto to people who want to sell crypto and, and it's, there's an intermediary. Now imagine that there's the beneficiary of, of this social impact interventions. There's the, um, the source of the capital, right? Who are the intermediaries? That NGO ecosystem, right? If they are now technology enabled, they're going to do an exponentially better job of connecting the two, the two worlds. What that means is that you have a better sense of a data-driven approach to quantify the challenge, you know, 
being able to pinpoint the location of the challenge. Here's the longitude, here's the latitude, and here's the number of people that will be impacted. Are you able to quantify every intervention to say, hey, what was the impact? Was it successful? And by the way, the beauty of this, of smart technology, is that you can apply an intervention, observe, report, improve, go back, and then that's the magic. That's the magic. Yes, 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 yes. That that is that is amazing work because it's 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 important for people to be able to use data to continue to monitor Absolutely. monitor um, their work. So Absolutely. um now just just to be clear, I want to talk talk to the audience right now. These questions are coming from you all. It's coming from you know M and E colleagues, you know, in different in even different parts of the world that have gathered some of these questions. So please listen up. So we're gonna keep on going. All right. So now, how can we use a monitoring information system platform to crowdsource outcomes? I think you 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 already alluded to that in your previous answer. Um, crowdsource outcomes and impact from field implementers, project beneficiaries or broad-based projects, which is, I believe, is one of the major challenges in the space today. Yeah, I know. So that's the beauty of mobile technologies, right? If you mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. it, everybody has a mobile phone. Now, yes. they may not have a smartphone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But exactly. even in fintech, that's why you have USSD. USSD makes it such that you don't have a browser, you you know, you type a short code and then boom, you're done. So I think if you look at what is happening in terms of the penetration of um, mobile phones, right, and the connectivity and in, in the most rural of the rural areas, it means that you now for the first time, you know, have connect connection to these beneficiaries. Now, the beauty of it is now you're now able to use technology and data to be able to you know, query, get data real time online. And, and by the way, a lot of NGOs struggle with raising capital because they don't have the relationships. I think the old world is where it's all about the relationship and who know who. The, the future world is embracing data, being transparent about like your beneficiary, the projects, the project objectives, the outcomes, and being able to get feedback, a feedback loop and continuous improvement, right? It's not, oh, okay, yeah, we, we just raised some money. Um, we'll come back to you in six months with what we find. No, it's literally <laughs> like every week I'm seeing what's happening. I'm seeing the hypothesis. I'm seeing a pilot and then the scale up and the scale up and the scale up and the feedback loop. So my hypothesis is that a lot of funders and, and, and folks who want to drive intervention, if they connect with the types of you know, um, NGOs and project implementers that are data-driven, technology-driven, real-time focus, that the ability to raise capital even without you know uh, 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 um, relationships and those types of things will be exponentially more. The ability to raise the right grants, attract the right money, and also be able to invest in that technology is gonna is gonna help. Now, what you have is a situation where some of the NGOs are not very sustainable because everything is manual everything is based on having hundreds and hundreds of people and a lot of paper and those types of things it's not sustainable because next year you don't gain the efficiencies of last year with paper but with technology with data with digital you just kind of see that continuous improvement and you're able to actually um, i think connect better with the types of outcomes that are tracks you know the, the 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 ngos that really really care about you know touching lives in the most remote areas okay excuse me <coughs> excuse me so that is really something so i want, I want to just ask a follow-up question to that sure. so like do you think it would be beneficial for donors to invest in um invest in technology for their beneficiaries for their grantees to actually use so that they can get that feedback loop that you've been talking about for the first couple of minutes 
Yeah, no, that's a very good question. The question is who invests in the technology? Is it the donor? Is it the um, you know? Is it the um, the implementers? Is it the the NGOs? And I think it's a little bit of everyone. I think it's a situation where there needs to be some element of collaboration. There needs to be some element of building some shared resources. You know, some technologies that could be reused. So some reusable components and technologies as well, because I think it needs to be joint efforts by everybody. I think governments who are interested in attracting the right resources for their people should invest in some of those technologies. I think donors that really want to be able to make sure that things are data driven should invest in technology. I think project implementers, you know, NGOs who are focused as well should do the same thing. And I think the more, and the tech community, I think the tech community also has to kind of invent new tools and new technology for the market. So I think it's really the work of the ecosystem. The ecosystem has to work together, collaborate. Um, and, and there's been some really, really um, um, good reference cases. I, I remember reading about the MyForce initiative, which was funded originally by the Gates Foundation. And that was how the concept of microfinance banking was actually invented that there's this category of people that actually need banking, but then the main type of bank doesn't cater to them. And so in, I think it was Bangladesh that they piloted yeah. this. Yeah, very successful. Now there's microfinance everywhere. And now there's actually some technologies, there's a technology called MyForce that was built, you know, by the community based on that need. So I think we just need more of that. We need m &E tools, we need identification tools. When I think about the work we did um, with the Bank of Industry to do micro lending, and what Bank of Industry wanted to do was to say, hey, we want to do this intervention, but instead of giving money away, why don't we use this concept of productivity as aid? right so instead of aid in terms of you know free money why don't we like give people small loans so that you drive their productivity they become self-sufficient but how do we do everything in a digital approach everything digital no manual process how we id the people how we push the money to them how they do their repayments how we track how many people in the community, all of it was all digital. And it was, wow. it seemed impossible at the time, but today it's the largest program in Africa in terms of reaching the most number of people in the shortest amount of time. Amazing, amazing. So that is, that is really something in terms of making sure that that we're able to use M and E to continue to inform the work that we do in the sector because um, yes, we still we we do use tools in terms of evaluating more of um, yes and no questions, you know, and uh, some of that kind of. with data capture, right? It begins with setting key objectives, right? Um, it begins with the theory of change that's driving that particular initiative. Um, and then it then uh, is all about how do you create the right visibility to the key stakeholders? Sometimes it's the public, right? Uh, sometimes it's it's government and, and you know, a governor or you know or the presidency mm -hmm. now in a way you know that data visibility is the answer to all things in our view and that's exactly what trail has been designed to accomplish okay okay that is really something because it it, it in terms of it's the data that is needed so um so uh, you just talked about governments in terms of how they are able to make decisions. So how can African, how might African governments
better integrate smart technologies in policy making, service delivery, and sustainable development. So how do they integrate that in, in, in what they do um, in terms yeah. of helping uh, society? Absolutely. I think one of the um, one of the work, some of the work that I'm very, very proud of is the work mm -hmm. that um, budget is doing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Nigeria. So you have yes. budget, you have tracker. And what did they do? It's very simple. They just said, hey, let's look at the Nigeria budget. Let's look at the mm -hmm. budget of a state mm -hmm. and let's turn it into nice little infographics that the common man can understand. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so let's play this role between citizens and government so that they can speak the same language. Because you'll find that sometimes that is a problem. So smart technology in this case is essentially infographics on top of the budget that nobody ever looks at, right? Yeah. Second, yeah. Second example is Tracker. What does Tracker do? Tracker says, well, there's National Assembly and the Senate, and they've created all these projects in your community where there's budget allocation for it, and it's supposed to uplift the community, schools, hospitals, right? You know, vocational centers and those types of things. Now, there is a disconnect. This disconnect is there's riots or there's unhappiness from the local citizens. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the politician wants to show that I've done a lot of work. I went and advocated for you in Abuja. Here's how much we brought in last year and so on and so forth. There's a disconnect. Now, let's take away whether it's corruption and those types of things because you can address that. But that's not the foundation of everything. The foundation of everything is data. The, the foundation of everything is understanding and communication. So we're speaking the same language. Where there's now a deviation in you know, in the alignment, you can now say, okay, what's the cause of the deviation? So we plan to build 10 schools in these locations with a carrying capacity of a million people or let's say 100,000 students. And we're spending 1 billion Naira. That is the objective, right? Now, in terms of actual, now you should have the data Where's the GIS technology that points at where it's supposed to be built? Where's the satellite technology that shows that there's something that is being built there? Where's the community tracking that shows pictures every step of the way? Because maybe the Senate did their work, but maybe the contractors were bad. So who is monitoring to say, he said everybody says nothing was done or the money was stolen or the... But, but we don't know, we don't have data. So we're very emotional about these things. Exactly. You know, so all we're saying is the beginning of change is smart technology. And when you do it, service delivery improves, policy making improves, sustainable development is achieved, you know, and that is essentially what Dubai has done. The UAE is the perfect example. They have these things called the happiness center. In the happiness centers, that's where they listen to citizens and they don't come and they will tell me what's wrong with you. They are, you have to capture it using data if you come to the happiness center. If you don't come to the happiness center, you have a phone and you can send it in. And somebody is sitting down and looking and saying, here's what we set out to do. Here's what people are not happy about. Our mission is to make our people happy. And you're able to use data to be able to solve that. And I think the same thing is applicable with the NGO ecosystem. I really think data is the answer to all things, but mm. maybe I'm biased, but I really think so. <laughs> you know, people, people are saying that data is now the new oil, you know, yeah. it's it, it really Absolutely. something. So we've talked about government now in terms of what they can use data to do and what they can use technology to do. So we're just gonna segue now into the development sector. So where do you see development partners leveraging technology in, in, in measuring the impact of their work? Absolutely. No, I think there's so many different ways. I think number one is um, they can leverage technology as it relates to you know, identification right? Okay. So identifying beneficiaries and, and, and targets and, and, and those types of things and locations. I think they can leverage technology as it relates to essentially visualizing their objectives and their th theory of change, right? I think they can leverage technology even in terms of 
how do you pick the best, you know, NGOs for a community, right? There's probably mm. 50 of them, mm. you know, but you want to pick the best, right? Mm. So how do you pick the 20 and then based on data, what data is telling you, you know, continue to, you know, invest through the best 10 data automation, you know, how do you even disburse the money and the mm -hmm. grants in the most efficient way anywhere you are in the world, mm -hmm. you know, technology, right? How do you track the results and the outcomes, you know, beyond just the basic, okay, we do, we, we went into this community here, all the pictures, see all the pictures, the picture is not telling me anything. The picture is telling me what happened on one particular day, which mm -hmm. could be very different the following day. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think also the outcome of what happens, you can use technology to do. So it's incredible the ways you can apply technology. The limits, it's it, it's limitless. It mm -hmm. is literally limitless. Okay. So that's uh, it, it's really something that you've talked about. You've talked about um, in terms of the development partners, in terms of them identifying nonprofits and. Um, making sure they find the best ones so that they can get the best outcomes for the work that they're, the outcomes and the work that they are trying to do in certain regions. So I'm going to segue now into the nonprofits themselves. Okay. So, you know, the issue with non local nonprofits, not just in Nigeria and in Africa, is institutional capacity. When I, when I go and uh, maybe a client hires me to do, go conduct an assessment of nonprofits around the country, I end up doing a brown brag session in terms of, no, this is how you do it. No, that is how you do it. So it's like, how does, does, it, does trial play a role with regards to collecting data to help them track the outcomes of the programs that they are doing with what they have so that it aids them to even get better? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is where, you know, you asked the question earlier that like who is supposed to like adopt technology? And I said the whole value chain. And mm -hmm. I think nonprofits in Africa, especially, yes, you know, you're using Excel today. Yes, you're taking pictures and you put it on Dropbox or Google Drive or something. But what is that next level, right? If you look yes. at private sector, private sector has improved. If you look at government, government has improved. Why is the NGO sector not keeping, you know, pace? That is really what we're talking about. The community is needed and Africa, especially more than ever, government cannot solve all these problems, you know, uh, at, at all. So private sector cannot solve all these problems. So I, I think there's, there's, there's a role there to, for example, CRM systems, right? proper CRM system so that every contact is digitally stored and tracked properly. Every activity with that contact is stored. So that's basic. That's like, you know, kind of like 101. You know, as you talk about data capture systems on the field, survey systems, again, there's 1,000 survey tools out there, but there's some that are specifically geared towards like, you know, nonprofits, right? And that's where, a tool like Trail comes in, and there are others similar that are definitely geared toward how do you track your value chain? How do you track your activities? How do you report on the activities you're doing? Because the day a donor partner comes and says, hey, we want to see, like, like they hire you, and they say, go and check for all these nonprofits. If you go to 10 of them, and one you go into, and every question that you ask, they're just pulling up a report right there. It's already like right there. It's just already right there. Like, who are you gonna pick? Very simple. Oh, yes. Very simple. That is that is really something that that would even make them stand stand out from the stand rest. Out. Things are not so analog driven. You know, it'd yeah. be interesting when I go and I conduct an assessment and somebody just gives me a tablet and says, "Okay, where's your CAC registration?" And says, "Okay, here here it is." Boom, right there. Exactly. It really be something, and these are, and this is even very key to even some of the top nonprofits, even in the country. And I've been everywhere, and I've seen the some of the best, and some of the ones that are just coming up. And it's like you know, if 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 uh, technology is used as an enabler in their work, it would really make a huge difference. Absolutely. So. Um, we're, we're almost rounding up. Um, so 
just a question. We're, we're, we're now getting curious, like, okay, you know, technology is going to help us. So um, how can organizations gain access to the trail software and how can they get started? Yeah, no, sounds good. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there is a website. Uh, I think it's called www.mytrail.io. Um, okay. um, okay. So you can go there anytime and sign up. We also have a team uh, that you can contact. The contact information is also on the website. So you can jump on at any time and essentially you know, contact somebody on there. Because I know sometimes technology can be scary. Sometimes you're just not sure you know um, how you should do it or, how, or where to start. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there's nothing to be scared of. You mm -hmm. know, there's somebody there that can, you know, assist you and support you. Uh, I believe we should even have like a live chat on it. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't, I think it's coming soon. Uh, okay. So my my trail M Y. Hello, everyone. So sorry about that. It looked like um, there's a bit of a net network glitch. Um, so my sincerest apologies about that. Um, but so that uh, we don't uh, we don't uh, take up too much of your time in terms of the the freezing of the uh, the broadcast. Just wanted to just kind of summarize. If you want to gain access to Trail, the Trail software, it's um, it's www.mytrail.io you know i think it's a really good uh, uh resource for uh civil society organizations and other organizations at large to be able to utilize monitoring and evaluation and um, utilize a software that will be able to aggregate and analyze and interpret the data in order for organizations to make decisions or uh, conduct advocacy and report to uh, targeted stakeholders so um you know that was an that that was an excellent, excellent, excellent interview. So I'm really grateful for Mr. Bumi Akinyemiju. So um, you know, thanks again for watching this interview with Mr. Bumi Akinyemiju, uh, the CEO of Venture Garden Group. Um, though there were a few glitches at the end, which is the venture arm of Greenhouse Capital that has invested in over 20 fintech startups up, across. Sub-Saharan Africa, one of which is Garden Social Ventures. Um, so it's a social enterprise that focuses on providing support for impact organizations aggregating data to better communicate their impact through technology. Now, our, our next session of Dev Sector Series is going to be is going to be live with Mr. Gwenga Sheson. He's the Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria, and there we're going to be discussing. Uh, digital rights and freedoms in Africa. You don't want to miss this. Also, a few announcements. The Social Impact Masterclass beta launch will be back online uh, Monday, September 13th, 2021, if you want to participate. Please indicate in the link in the description, you know, or reach out to me via WhatsApp, and I will be happy to contact you all. 
Thank you again so much. Um, I have a few announcement videos and uh, thank you guys so much. And uh, let's change the world together. Take care. Everyone, thank you for watching the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Are you interested in sponsoring Dev Sector Series? Please call me at 234 703 539 As we spread your brand, we spread around the world. And as we do that, we are all changing the world. So let's work together. Contact me so that we can maximize social impact. I look forward to hearing from you. And then you know, the environment was cleaned up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. I dealt with social impact consulting.